Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Welcome to Warren. Chapel CME Church. We are so glad to have you in the sanctuary and those persons that are online virtually. It's so pleased to worship God with you. We welcome you to praise God, the true and living God. We even welcome you to send notifications so that on Facebook so that people can worship with us. As we are worshiping here, we are delighted that you are worshiping online. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the joy, the peace, the love, the understanding, Lord, that comes from you. During this Advent season, we are delighted and remembering the birth of Christ. And when Jesus was coming into the world for the specific time that you had already anointed. Lord, we worship you in spirit and in truth. We are lifting our holy hands and saying, you are worthy to be praised. Praise your name. We worship you because you are wonderful. You are a great God. You are awesome. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are Jehovah Nisi. We say thank you. Bless your name. We're here to shout. We're here to sing. We're here to do everything because you are a wonderful God who is worthy of our praise. You have saved us. You have redeemed us. Lord, we repent of our sins so that we can worship you, so we can lay at your feet. And we say thank you. Thank you for all things. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Please stand to your feet so that we can worship God in song. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give God a hand clap of praise because he is worthy of the glory. Let us join together in praise and worship. Come on, put those hands together. Me 
certainly deserves our highest praise. Amen. This song says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait on the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. If that's your praise, if that is your worship today, won't you sing along?
suffered any of this, I will see the goodness of the Lord. I will confident in this, I will see the goodness of the Lord. Can you sing that with me? I will remain confident in the goodness of the Lord. has done great things for us and we are glad. Why don't you give God a hand of praise on this morning. We are thankful. We are grateful for another day that God has blessed us with. Amen. As we continue to celebrate celebrate this uh, Advent season and even a, a couple of weeks ago as we marched in the San Pedro Christmas Parade, the goal was to remind people that Jesus is the reason for what? For this season. Amen. And so we celebrate God on today. We celebrate Jesus and in this Advent season uh, if I am correct, this week uh, would be the camp even as things are happening. Amen. You may be seated as I uh, just have a few announcements and things that I want to share with you um, on this morning. And so let me say I'm thankful and grateful for all of you, uh, whether in this space or in the virtual space. Amen. Uh, I am just thankful that God kept us, right? Another Sunday that we can come and give God all the praise with so much that goes on in our world and around us. Um, it could have been us, amen? In a hospital bed, it could have been us who could not make it, but because of his grace and his mercy, we are yet alive, amen? And so we celebrate God. Um, let me uh, very quickly, um, I'm thankful um, for all of our guests, but let me recognize um, on this morning, uh, Danielle Sandoval, if she does not mind standing uh, as well, and I know she didn't come for this, and this is Joseph, uh, and Danielle, um, we know that she ran, right, um, in our church conferences we spoke, she ran for uh, District 15, amen, for the council seat, um, and so she ran a great uh, campaign, and though it may not have come out um, as we or as she would have liked it to, uh, we still believe God for all that he has for you. Um, I believe that she has a great work that she wants to do in our community and our world. Um, and so we've gotten to know each other um, over some time. I didn't know she was coming today, but I am delighted uh, to see you as well as you, Joseph. Um, and what I thoroughly respect about her is that when we met, um, because we always know the connection between clergy um, and those in office and those who are running, um, is that when, her, when we met and I met with her team, um, if you notice, she did not come to the church during her campaign season. Um, and it was not because we were not communicating or that she didn't think that we were good enough to stop by. She just said that she wasn't going to merge that with her campaign. She wasn't going to use the church to further her campaign. And so we thank you for that and we honor you for that. Um, and so um, I'm just thankful that you are here with us. Um, it will be her choice, but at the end of service, if you have anything that you want to share with us, I will give you that opportunity. Um, but I know that she came to worship and again, uh, Joseph, who has been right by her side, running with her everywhere you see her, you see him. And so thank you um, as well. Amen. Um, let me say I am thankful to our outreach team. Um, we know that we seek to be a church, right? We are committed um, and we are concerned about those who are disadvantaged, whatever that way may be. And so for my time here as pastor, one of the things that we have done is we've always been a part of prison fellowship um, and then angel tree where we um, give gifts to uh, children of incarcerated parents on behalf of that parent. That's what the goal of it. And so on this year, how many gifts did we give away this year? 32. Amen. Give God a hand of praise. So 32 children uh, received gifts on yesterday. And so I'm thankful to our outreach team who was here. Uh, I am also uh, very thankful to the San Pedro 
uh, committee network, I believe, that they gave us gift cards to make sure. And so a local organization um, here in San Pedro that we are part of. And then a special thanks to Mr. Howard Scott um, in the City of Lights. Amen. And he gave uh, gift cards as well. Um, and so I'm thankful that we were able to collaborate. I'm thankful for the church. Um, but I'm thankful for the community organizations and all of us who came together um, to make sure um, that children of incarcerated parents receive gifts. And you guys know how dear that is to my heart um, because I was once one of those angel tree children. Amen. Um, and so we will continue um, to do that. We hope to every year if we can increase our numbers. I think we've always done a minimum of 30. I think one year we did like 60 or 80. Um, and so however God blesses us, but I want us to know that we're always making a difference um, in our community. I want to remind you that on next Sunday, we will be here um, because it will be Christmas. Amen. We are going to alter the service a little. We will have service at 930 a.m. I know somebody said, oh, that's early. Uh, but we get up and we go to work and we go everywhere at 6, 7, whatever time they tell us to be there. All right. And so I know you may wake up and you may have your food on the stove or the oven. So we will get you here at 930. Um, but our children will be a part of our program on next week. Um, and so at 930, our children will celebrate. Um, I don't intend for us to be here more than an hour and maybe 10 minutes, all right? So we will be in, we will be out um, so that we can enjoy that day as a church family, but then you all can go and be with your family. So we will be here at 930 uh, where our children um, and those of our Board of Christian Education will ch celebrate our Christmas program. And then for our children who are here who will be a part, you will have two uh, more rehearsals. You will rehearse today immediately following service. Is that correct, Reverend Curry? Uh, and you meet Reverend Curry in the fellowship hall, and then you will meet Christmas Eve, I believe, that's Saturday at 11 a.m. in the morning, all right? Um, I believe that is all that I have at this time. At this time, this praise team is coming back to us. Why don't you give them a hand? And we always encourage, right, as they are singing, it is, it is corporate. There is, there is intentionality, all right, behind what it is that we, we are doing. And so even though you see uh, that Shari is here alone, um, uh, standing up here, um, we seek, right, in the goal that we're trying to fulfill before God gives us more praise and workers, worship singers, our choir, or whatever. For this season, God has laid it on our hearts that the church, right, that we'll join together in one body, all right? Before the church ever got so big that we were paying everybody to do everything and everything was about, the church just came together and gave God praise in one voice, amen? And so if God has blessed you, if God has kept you, if he's done anything for you, you ought to sing loud. If I can sing, y'all hear me? If I'm singing out loud and I got to be the worst singer in the whole entire church, Okay, if I'm not embarrassed to sing out loud, I encourage all of you to stand, lift your hands, whatever it is. But we have come in this place to give God praise because he has been good. Has he not? And so I say, pour out your praise on him. Don't be afraid to sing, clap and worship in your own way. God bless you.
Fill my life till all they see is in this preaching moment as I stand to proclaim this your word and your gospel to these your people. I pray that in all that I do, Father, that you will be glorified. I pray that in all that I say, Father, you will be lifted up. So I pray that the people don't see Adam, that they don't hear Adam but they hear the words that you have poured down deep in my heart. Father, I pray that someone will be encouraged and strengthened. 
light shining on trees and all over town. But in someone, their heart, their mind, their spirit, there's darkness that pervades them. And so I pray for those of us who stand in that place that your word, Father, will be a light. And give us the strength and weaker and courage to go another day to be all that you've called us to be. Give us strength, Father. Bless our time, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Give God a hand of praise on this morning. We are thankful, grateful for another day um, to share God's word. Amen. And this is the, the second week as we deal with a series entitled Glad Tidings. Uh, and if you remember my opening and what I shared on last week, that, that in this season, I, I know that we are intentional about the decor. I know that we are intentional uh, about the celebration. I know that it's supposed to be, and it is a joyful season and a joyful time. Um, however, what we pointed out on last week is that although that may be the custom and although that may be um, what the season in the world tells us, um, I said on last week that there is a group, there is a body, there are some, amen, where that just may not be the case. And so a change in a calendar, right, a change in decor does not change someone's mental um, or emotional circumstances. Stay with me. I shared with you on last week that, that, that studies show that primarily during this time and during this season, at times, depression and certain things increase for others. And so while some may be celebrating and some may be jovial or some think that they have to have a smile on their face and a, and a pretty sweater during this time, there are others who are fighting demons and fighting their mind all day long. Uh, study shown on last week, three out of five, right? Three out of five, right? Which could be uh, some of us in, in this particular room that they would say that during this season, someone is in a, a state of depression because they think about loved ones and they're missing them. Stay with me. Los Angeles Times on this week even dealt with that, the grief that's in this season. And so what I pointed out was that, that for in, in certain places in which I have worked, right, um, because of the demographics, so in, in the penal system, in the prisons, or at the VA hospital, during this season, right, they, they overly check on, right, um, the patients, or they overly check on the inmates because sometimes this season brings the morale down and sometimes the suicide rates go up. Stay with me. And so I thought that if, in, in, if in, my, in my public profession, it was my job to be, um, to make sure that I was alert and that I was aware of everyone's mental, physical, and emotional condition, then I would have to think that if it's happening in there, then there be someone in my care in the church who I have to pay extra attention to during this season as well. What do you mean? Just because you're here on today don't mean that you're okay. There could be the possibility that someone walked up this morning and said, how are you doing? And what, by nature, because it's what we've always done, you said, I'm fine. And if you're real churchy, you said, I'm blessed, I'm highly favored. But the reality is what? That just may not be true. And so it's important that we build a space and a place as the church, particularly, that no one ever suffers in silence. That it's okay if, if Pastor Adam, right, if I show up every now and then someone and I say I'm not okay and it does not mean that I don't have faith or that I don't believe that God is mighty or that I don't believe that God is real. It just means that I'm in a place in my life at this particular moment and I need someone to love me, encourage me, and check on me, right? And so it is my hope, right, that we, we build a place, a space where we are able to be vulnerable with each other, that even in a season as we go up and down and things go on, that we are taking care of each other. And so look around the room. Look at the person sitting next to you and understand this, whether they tell you or not, that they may not be okay. 
And so for the purpose of this season, and I know that we're preaching Advent, and I know that Jesus is the reason of the season, and I believe that, and I thank God for the gift that he gave us in Jesus Christ, and I celebrate Jesus. I'm thankful to God that he gave me the best thing that he had to offer in his son, Jesus. And so I worship him. I praise him. I adore him. I'm glorifying him. I'm thankful for this season. But with that, I got to share. And so on last night, I said, if, if, if you fall in this space or place, um, then I, 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 it may not be anything in your life that you're looking forward to, but, but I gave you scripture as we looked at First Peter, I believe it was last week, and we talked about remaining hopeful, a reason to remain hopeful. And so on today, um, I share with you, and I'll preach from Isaiah 61, 1 and 3, from this, a reason to rejoice. Uh, because there may not be, right? And there may be things that are going on in each and every one of our lives, and someone may feel that they don't have a reason, or there's nothing that positive that is going on that you have to rejoice um, in your life on today. And so I just wanted to take scripture, um, and I wanted to share um, on today and potentially give you a reason that you can celebrate and that you can rejoice um, based on who God is, based on what it is that God has said in his word. Amen, somebody? Um, that gives you a reason, even in this season, to rejoice. So if you follow me on your phone, on your Bible, or your iPad, somewhere, uh, to Isaiah, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 61, and we'll quickly look at verses 1 through 3, and it is not my intention to be overly sermonic on today, um, but it is my intention to be conversational or devotional, if you will, amen? And so what I'm saying to you is permit me to have a conversation with you. And so while I know that you're listening, amen, um, it's good that every now and then, and not for my pride, but it's good to want to know that people are listening. So I'm saying it's okay to talk back to me. It's okay that if I say something, right, that may sound good or may come down your street, amen, that you let me know that we're in a good place, all right? Um, because that, that, that is the goal. And again, it's not for my pride. Uh, I know some people need you to say amen so I can feel good about my sermon. And there may be a small little piece of me that needs that every day when I get home on Sunday and say I did good today, but on today. It's for the purpose, amen, of ministry, and so we are conversational on today. Isaiah chapter 61, um, and it reads this way, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And so here, you have Isaiah who is speaking to a people who have been captive in Babylon. A people who are struggling. A people who, while they are physically, hear me, um, captive, you can't help but be right, and we ignore that part, especially when we think about culture and, and, and cultures who have been enslaved, is that we always think of the physical shackles in which someone is, but we never understand the what? The psychological, right, and physiological things that begins to happen to someone when they are held captive, right? And so here is a group that is held captive, and maybe they are captive in Babylon, and they're in chains or whatever that may be, or be enslaved, but you cannot forget what possibly is going on in their mind, in their heart. And so what, the, so what the author, uh, what Isaiah seeks to do, the prophet Isaiah, right, one of our major prophets, what he seeks to do is he, sent, he prophesies to them, right, um, about this comfort. And so the text, what you can find, it is a text that is overly comforting intentional about comforting these people, though they are in this situation, in this trial. But as we work our way right through through the text, what we see is it's not only comforting, but it's transforming at the same time. Come with me. Stay with me. Because there is one thing for me to offer you comfort, right? Um, but for anyone, uh, it's, it's okay for you to tell me everything's going to be all right, everything's going to work out. But um, this is what I want. For everyone who receives comfort, you want to know that the situation is going to get better. 
And so for the sake of the believer, for the sake of the Christian, right, for those who worship God and trust God, for them, if they find themselves in a situation in Babylon, right, captive, it's so good, it's good for the prophet to tell them that God can and God will. But what I like about the text, he not only tells them, comforts them that God can, that God will, that God sees them, watch, but as we work our way through it, he says, I not only give you comfort, but I'm going to tell you how God is going to do it at the same time. And so my goal and my intention on today is as I preach and as I teach for those who may find themselves in a a particular predicament or problem, I can tell you this, that God is mighty, that God is powerful, that God can redeem, that God is our peace, that God is our strength. But I can also tell you as I comfort you, I cannot tell you when or how, but I can tell you that God can also transform your situation if you continue to hope in him and trust him. So I'm giving you today a reason to what? A reason to rejoice before it even happens. When God says that he can and he will, we begin to celebrate him before the chains even fall off. Stay with me. And so the text, Isaiah, right? He says, the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. Watch this. What he's saying is essentially, I'm bringing you good news. There's nothing like good news when you're in a bad situation. I, I could imagine for a group that's, that, 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 is, that has been held captive, for a group that has been taken from their home, from a group um, that is being oppressed, um, and every day is bad news. They're just waiting on one day where they can find, get some good news, right? And for the person today whom I may be talking to in this intrinsically sacred space are those who are at home sitting on the couch or the edge of the bed listening to what I am saying on today. I have good news for you that God has anointed to me and spoke into my spirit that I would share with you that you would be encouraged in this season. And so what he says then is I have a in season word for those who are weary. Anybody ever been weary? And, and when we say that we are weary and for those who are weary and what this means to be weary is just to be what? It's a tiredness that comes over you. Watch this, and it's a tiredness from exertion, meaning it's a tiredness from what? Excessive or physical mental effort. Watch this. Sometimes I'm not tired because I didn't get no sleep. I'm tired because while I tried to sleep, I kept waking up every few hours because of what is going on in my life, my heart, my family, my neighborhood. It plagues me. And so sometimes I'm not just physically tired. I am mentally and emotionally exhausted. Has anybody ever been there? And so he says, I got, I got, I got good news for you. All right. I received a text early this morning, um, and it's not odd in my profession and what I do that people reach out. Um, And the person um, who sent me the text, they said, you know, um, Pastor Adam, I I keep trying to sleep, but every time I try to sleep, I abruptly, I keep getting waking up. I keep jumping up out out, out of my sleep, said, and so they went on to tell me all these things that are, are, are on their mind. And so what I realized is that sometimes we sleep, sometimes we lay down, but we cannot find rest. I'm tired. Y'all talk to me. I'm weary. I'm I'm doing the very best that I can. There's good news. Because the prophet Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, watch this, to bring good tidings to the poor. Right? And when he uses his word poor, he means those who are, watch this, they're poor are afflicted. But we have a tendency every now and then when we talk about poverty or we talk about those who are poor, it is always a matter of how much money you have in your pocket or what's in your bank account. And so then we separate the world by those who are rich um, and those who are poor. But here is the reality and here is the truth is that you can, um, in terms of your money or your finances, you can be okay there, right? Um, You can have a few dollars in the bank. You can have food in the refrigerator. Um, The car can have some gas and, and the kids can be okay. But reality is you're still poor. Watch this. How can that be, Pastor Adam? I got money. Everything should be okay. There are some people in this world who walk on Wall Street every day of their life, have enough money to go get private jets and go anywhere else that they want to go in the world. There are some homes right now that if you walk into it, there are gifts as high as the middle of the tree and everybody is going to get what they want for Christmas and more. Got enough to bless everybody around them, but they're poor. Somebody say poor. Because to be poor, watch this, is to be downtrodden and disadvantaged. 
It's, 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 it's just when the odds still, where I can have money, but the odds still are stacked up against me. It can be, I can be in the best situation that I think, but I feel helpless in my situation. There, and, and it comes from this, watch this. It comes from an oppressive state that, 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 that comes is where I understand that there are powerful people or powerful things around me that have the ability for, for me to be downtrodden. Does that make sense? And so because of the world and the way that it is set up, because of our jobs and because of all of these things, watch, I can have a job that puts money in my account every two weeks, direct deposit, but the atmosphere in which I work is oppressive and I feel downtrodden or disadvantaged. And every time I pull in the parking lot, I get a headache just looking at the building because I know who and what I have to contend with. Stay where you can have money and be poor. You can have a whole lot of things and be afflicted. And so he says that I'm coming with a word to those who what? With good news to those who are poor. He said, but at the same time, he says, God has sent me. He says, to bind up the brokenhearted. Uh, when I went through a heartbreak uh, in my life, and I'm not the only one, so don't laugh at me. All of us have been through some heartbreak or another, whether it was in kindergarten or whether you was 35 years old. And so um, I remember uh, going through uh, my divorce um, that I remember being broken hearted. Anybody ever been broken hearted? And I said to a friend, I said, man, if I had a broken arm, I'd go to the doctor. You know, if I had something, I could go, where the heck do you go for a broken heart? Where, where you, you can physically see when the bone is sticking out when there's a broken, but where do you go when the pieces of your heart and everything is shattered within? And I, I asked that question, right? not trying to be overly deep. I said, man, but where, where do you go when you have a break, break, broken heart? But the interesting thing about the text is though uh, 10, 12 years ago in my life, um, I really didn't understand where to go. What the text is teaching me is while we may not have somebody on staff at Kaiser for a broken heart, there is a God in heaven, amen, that you can go to when you have a broken heart who I found out that he's a heart fixer, right? And so when your heart is in pieces, it seems nothing and no one can put it back together. It's good to know that the God who created Created me and knows every hair on my head and fashioned me in my mother's womb. And so what the text is saying is that the only person who can repair a broken heart is a God who sits high and knows about the condition of your heart. And he says, God has sent me, watch this, to point you to the one. I know you're searching and I know that you're trying, but I'm pointing you to the one, watch, he says, to bind up the broken heart. If, if, if. And this is me taking a, a leap theologically. If I was to impale myself in any way and on my way to the hospital, I would typically what? I would typically get a bandage or something that I can well, hold the bandage to stop the bleeding until I get to the place that I need to get. What I find interesting about the text is he says that God has sent him, watch here, to bind up the brokenhearted. Watch, meaning that God will put ministers and people in our life when we're brokenhearted. They can just stop the bleeding and the hurt. And Pastor Adam can tell you something to stop the bleeding. Watch this. But I can't fix your heart. What I can do is love you enough until I point you to the God who can deal with your situation. And so he points out in the text that there is someone, watch this. And so he deals with this in the, in the binding, the broken heart. It speaks of a ministry. Y'all stay there with me. That the church should function, as I shared a little bit earlier, as a place that I should be able to come vulnerably when my heart is broken or I find myself in a broken condition, that the people around me would gather around me, what? Watch this. If it's to bind up and minister to me and give me healing and say words of exhortation and say words of encouragement, it should be a place that I can come no matter what my problem is, that I come and lay on the altar. And when I'm crying, nobody's saying, well, what's going on with her? And what's going on? But everybody, they see my condition, get up out their seat and come and they bind. Watch this. Meaning to minister, meaning to to speak to my situation and say something to me, reminding me of what it is that God can do. Sometimes we just nosy, if you want to be honest. 
But God says it, it should be a pain. So when God has anointed us, hear me, when God has gifted it, whatever your particular gift is. And so while I'm called to pastor and to preach, God has given some, watch this, the gift of prayer. Some of you, right, has given you uh, gifts of, of exhortation, gifts of encouragement, where God has given you, where you have words that come in your mouth, just ha- that always have a way, where they are, you always encourage people everywhere you go. And so then, if God has anointed you and gifted you with that, it would mean that you would have to be aware of those who are around you. And I don't care if you're in the bank, if that is the gift that God gave you, he didn't just give it to you so you can use it at church from 11 to 1, but he gave to you that you can use it every day because we have a world full of people who are what? Who are broken hearted and they're looking for someone to love them. Stay with me. And so the, the writer here says that God has anointed him. Watch this. Because we have a world of those who are poor, whether physically or emotionally. We have a world that we know that we have people who are broken hearted and when I come down your street you ought to say amen. But watch this. He says I already came to proclaim liberty to the captives. I told you that this group in Babylon, that they had been taken from their home, and here they were in a place that was not home. And so because they were captive, and, and another word for captive then would be a prisoner, right? And so they're being held captive by another person. <laughs> it's going to make sense to somebody. Uh, they're being captive by a people who are not their own. They're being bound by a people, right? Meaning that they are in prison, Right? Are, 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 are in jail, right? And, 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 and so what he's saying is I'm, I'm coming, but I'm coming to proclaim, which meaning I'm coming to speak, right? And in some texts, um, it speaks of it, I'm coming to sing, right? I'm coming to give a word that will what? That will release the captive, right? That's what he says, that will give liberty, that will give freedom to the captives, right? And so he's coming from word that he would say something, right? That he would speak something that would be freeing and when I look at this word liberty or free what it really means in context is if you had a bottle of ointment or oil or something like that um, when you pull the cap or when you pull the top um, it could be something that is on top of it where it's holding up the flow. You ever been there where you've been trying to pour something, but there's something that's in the way from the flow? And so once you clear that out, what you find is that it froze freely. Watch this. And so what he's saying is that there is a word that he is coming with that God is doing where they people will be free, right? Completely free. But it gets deeper there and where it impacted me is that he, he, he compares it to the fact of those who are in prison. Watch this. In, in our day and time, because there are rules that are set, um, even though prison is not a comfortable place, there are still rules about certain things that have to happen in a prison. Come with me. When, when I worked at the prison, they had to have breakfast by a certain time, lunch by a certain time, dinner by a certain time. They got to watch TV for a certain time. We didn't get to, we control when the lights went out, but there was a time when we turned the lights out on the inmate. And so they have certain privileges in this day and time. I got to take you back. Historically, when someone was in prison in this day and time, they would be tucked away in a dark dungeon for a long amount of time. And so what he is saying in the text is he's coming to free the who have been in a place of darkness that they could now have light. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. There are some of us who feel like we have been locked away in the dark dungeon of life. And God is saying, I know that it's dark in there. I know that it's damp in there. I know you feel alone in there. But God says, I'm coming to speak a word of liberty and I'm coming to speak a word of freedom, a free flow into your situation. Watch some Somebody missed it. There are some things in your life that are stopped up and blocked, and God says, I'm coming to clear it, that your blessings will flow freely, that nothing will inhibit what it is that I have for you. Stay with me. God says, not only am I going to cause your blessings to flow freely, but I'm going to take you out of that dark situation. And so it is akin to taking someone out of a dark situation and presenting them in a place of light. Now, here's the struggle. This is me getting deeply, even though I ain't got no degree in that, so don't believe, don't let nobody tell you that. Psychological, though. That if you've ever been in a dark place for a long time, what happens when light come on? It's painful. It hurts. Y'all stay with me. Let's just get real. You kind of shield yourself and cover. And so a person who has been in a dark, here we go. 
this world can be in such a place and some of the traumas and things that we have been through, that there are those, watch this, who can be freed from prison. You ever met a person like this? And they go back to prison three days later. Because they are more conditioned to be locked up than they are to be free. So they rather be in a place of darkness than a place of freedom. Watch this. Because sometimes freedom and light hurts. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. And so there are some of us whom God has saying, I'm trying to bring you out of your dark situation. Y'all stay with me. Into the light. But sometimes the light has a tendency to expose things that we're not ready to deal with. And so some of us, though we're saved and we've given our life to God and we come to church and we shout and we have a smile on our face. Y'all ain't going to talk to me on this morning. Watch this. We don't really want some things to be exposed to the light. So we'd rather stay in darkness. But I'm coming to speak freedom to somebody who wants to heal your past traumas. God is saying, come out of that dark place. I know it hurts, but I'm the same God that though it hurts, watch this, after a little while, pay attention, you get adjusted to the light. And then things become a little more clearer. So what God is saying, I know initially there will be a situations in your life where it's hard to come out of, but if you trust me enough, eventually it becomes clearer and the pain comes away and it's easier to walk in light than it is in darkness. And so in this season, I believe that God is trying to bring someone out of those dark places into his what? To his marvelous light. Can I tell you a story? Because I'm always transparent. I struggle with depression and anxiety. When I sat down and the people talked to me, I had to take a walk to try to figure out where that it came from. And so I tracked my life to where circumstances and things that were in my home caused me to have anxiety. Okay? Watch. And so I remember being a child who, because of this, I had fear and trouble sleeping at night. Y'all stay with me. So I remember being afraid because it was dark. And I would come downstairs, and this is the same thing and the best, right? And I would come to my mom, and she'd say, go back up there and get in your bed. But up there was scary for me. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. And I'm not saying she wasn't a being a good mother. That's just what parents did. Talk to me a minute, now go back up, upstairs. And so what my mom didn't know is because sometimes my mom would sleep downstairs on the couch because we only had so much space in the house where so the kids got the beds and the parents got the couch. Thank God for the sacrifice that she made that she would sleep on the couch. But I would be t- fearful of going back, watch this, into the dark. And so in the projects where I grew up, we didn't have carpet. We had them cold floors. But I was so afraid to go is that so my mom couldn't see me, I would lay down right next to the couch where she couldn't see me in the cold. Watch this. And I would never go because I just needed to be close enough where I knew that someone could take care of me. Yo, this is going to make sense to somebody in a minute. I'm going to close. And so I remember being an adult. This is like a year ago. And I started dealing with my traumas. And I had to have an actual conversation with my mom to remind her. And she never knew. And I told her the story. I said, I'm 40 years old almost, but I can still feel the coldness of the floor because sometime I was trying to have close relationship with you, but you kept telling me to go back. And it was like I was 39 years old, but I could still feel the coldness of the floor. And I would shiver, but I was just looking for comfort. I'm, I'm not the only one with trauma. And so I had to share this with my mother so that I can come out of that place I had been in since I was four five years that God can restore the situation. Now it wasn't easy for my mother or I but once we had the conversation and let the light come in it was uncomfortable for a little while but me and my mother have a better relationship today because of staying instead of staying in the dark we decide to let God deal with the uncomfortable. God says and if you can become better then I can take you to the places that I have for you but you can't carry that baggage to the place that I, y'all ain't gonna talk to me I'm done so God said this is the good news this is what he's trying to do what he will do for his people verse number seven he said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance for God to comfort all those who mourn what God was showing him he uses the repetition of the word proclaim that he uses in verse one and verse two so he's dealing with the same subject one writer says but with an altered point of view watch In verse 1, the proclamation touched on the human side, freedom, release, 
but now it concerns the divine side. I missed it. He said, I came to proclaim the human side. Remember I told you that God will give comfort, so it's a word of comfort, but it's also a word of transformation. And so when he initially proclaims, he says, I've come to proclaim this, this, this to you to tell you about what's coming your way. But it's as if the prophet gets out of the way and he begins to move from the human side to proclaiming on the divine side. He says, I was speaking of all that is ha can happen on your behalf, but now let me point you to the one who is able to do it. And so what this begins to speak of, watch this, is the favor of God, the compassion of God. Watch this. It begins to talk about this prolonged period in which God, though they have been in this situation, and it seems like forever in comparison to the favor of the Lord and what he is getting ready to do in their life, it would be as if that is meant, what they've been through will be minimal in comparison to what it is that God is getting ready to do in their life. Stay with me. It speaks of this compassion that will flow freely. And it speaks of this, when you've been oppressed and you've been victimized by someone more powerful than you, you need someone who can come and avenge you. Does that make sense? And so the Bible speaks of this inevitable, inevitable day of vig, vig, vengeance that is coming on behalf of the people will be a stark contrast to what it is that they had been through watch so when God comes and avenges you what it means is that when God comes that God always wins when God turns it around you're completely turned around when God frees you you're completely free does that make sense here we go because you guys know I love stories to make it come real my little brother will be getting out of prison um, in just a few weeks um, but when he gets out of prison I'm gonna take him to a halfway house meaning Technically, he halfway in and he halfway out. Out here, but he still belongs to the federal government for another year while he's on how while he's on this, right? And so he's he's free, but he's not. It's a tug of war because though I'm gonna pick him up in the morning and drive him here, I still have to go present him back in custody at night and sh so he can show up at the time that they say. So he's free, but he's not. Can I show you what favor and the vengeance of the Lord is? But what the text implies, right? Some of us are kind of in this tug of war in life because we haven't completely surrendered to God and we won't let God avenge us, right? And so we're in this middle ground. But can I tell you, when God frees you and God sets you free, you are completely free. What are you saying pastor Adam you are no longer bound to your past you are no longer bound to your enemies you are no longer bound to your sin you are no longer bound to your conditions you are no longer bound to your addictions because God comes and he avenged you and he snatched you out of the hand of what of Satan and sin God has given us the authority and the power to walk in the freedom and the liberty that God why because God came and avenged us and when God comes God God always wins because he has all power in his hands. It's not an if. It's the matter of fact of knowing who you are. When God does it, God cannot fail. God has all power in his hand. God has defeated the enemy. God has defeated your path. What he's saying is we got to just walk in it. Sometimes the problem is we have not walked in the favor in which God has given us. Because of where we've been, remember I told you, there is a psychological condition that is attached to those who were locked up and bound to something. And so there is a mental part. Though we come to the church and start serving, there still is a, has to be a belief that we believe that God has freed us and set us free. I'm done. Uh, this last week I was in a conference in Orlando. Um, and when I got there, um, I saw every big-name politician, every big-name preacher, I mean, everybody there was somebody important. And, and my, my introverted nature started to take over. I didn't really feel comfortable in that space. So I text my, text Char, text my wife, I said, Shari, I'm here, you gotta pray for me because I'm watching my, I'm, I'm going in my shell, but I know I need to. I said, but I'm nobody, stay with me. I'm in this room full of people, great people, great people. 
and I'm sitting at tables surrounded with, while other people who paid the same price that I paid to be there, they're seated all the way in the back. But somehow God had maneuvered the situation where I'm sitting in the front with all. And so I'm within a distance of touching all the important people. And so I said, sure, you got to pray for me because my introverted side and I know I need to network, but but that side of me. Right. And and so my, my past started to sneak in. I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. I don't have the same education as all these people. Um, uh, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I really should get up from this table and just go in the back um, where I feel comfortable because I don't deserve to be here. And so I told my wife, I said, I'm just a nobody. And it's all these people around me and they're great. And she said, no, the fact that God has favored your life and allowed you to be there lets you know that you are somebody. So you sit there with confidence and you enjoy where God has elevated elevated you to watch this but my emotions started to get in the way of the place in which God had prepared for me to be it didn't shock God that I was sitting around talking to great people God just needed me to believe that he had put everything inside of me that I deserve to be in that place because that's where God elevated me what are you saying when God has favored you and given you and freed you to walk in places don't you dare deny who God has called you to to be and to run back into the darkness when God has set it up to exalt your life don't you dare let nobody bring your past up against you and tell you where you belong to be I deserve to sit at this table I deserve to shake hands I deserve you don't know what I've been through to get to where I am at this table that's what God is saying to somebody on today nobody tell you where you deserve to be if God opened the door, you walk through it with confidence. I'm done. God says, I come, verse 3, to console those who mourn. God says, I know you've been crying. But I'm a God of consolation. I'm a God that knows how to comfort you and rock you and keep you when, when nobody don't answer the phone. God says, I got a way of consoling you. And giving you love that no mother, no father, or no one. God says, I've come to console the one who's mourning. Watch. I know that you're mourning, but God speaks through the text and God says, if you allow me, I'll console you. Here we go. Watch how he consoles them there. I'm in verse 3 and I'm done. He says to give them beauty for their ashes. I'm in verse 3. So I had to look at the text. And it's a text which says what God is providing. Hear me. And so the writer, one writer says it is a replacement therapy, if you will. And so the people are captive and bound in Babylon, which means that they would be in ashes and be of low estate. One writer says, watch how God works from the top to the bottom. Because when someone was anointed in that day in time, Psalm 133, if you need to check, when Aaron was anointed, they poured the oil over the top of his head and it streamed over everything all the way down to his robe. Watch this. When God begins to move in your life and change your situation, there is a replacement, watch, where God takes one thing and replaces it with the next we go. If I take my car to be worked on and there is a problem with my transmission or my engine, they don't leave both in there. They take the old one that's no good out and junk it and put something new in so that my car can what? Run at its optimal. Y'all missed it. And so when you gave your life to God, can I tell you that God gave you replacement therapy, surgery spiritually? He took out everything that was broken and malfunctioning and that would never work he took that out and he junked it and he put brand new in watch this he says in the text so I'm giving them what beauty for their ashes there is replacement therapy I know you've been in a dark place but God says I am going to it means to adorn your head with something beautiful God is giving you something beautiful for everything that you've been through somebody say I deserve it he said then I'm going to give them oil of joy for their mourning Contextually, when someone would grieve, they would be in sock, um, sackcloth and ashes. And so to be down and to be in despair. But when someone was brought out, I don't know if you remember, when Joseph had to go meet um, uh, the king, Pharaoh, in, in Genesis, 
The Bible says that he went and took off his garments that he had on, which were prison garb, and he, prepared, he prepared himself to stand in the face of what? Of royalty. And so in order to do that, he had to bathe. And I know who I'm talking to in here, right? Anytime we bathe, all of us who've been raised in the house, when you bathe, you still, after you get out the bathtub, what's the first thing you put on? Y'all ain't going to talk. Lotion and oil, right? You be, if you ever was a kid like me and you came downstairs and you was ashy all over your face, the first thing my mama said was, if you don't get back upstairs and put some Vaseline, because that's all we had is a big old tub of Vaseline, some Vaseline on your face, you ain't getting ready to go to that school. And so we'll be sick, slick, and shining and glowing all over the place, because if we don't do nothing as people, we make sure that we put on a whole lot of Vaseline and grease and stuff. Our hair. God says, watch this. He says, I'm, I'm exchanging replacement therapy. Why? Because they've been in a down place. He says, I'm going to give you the oil of joy for your mourning. Watch this. There is a replacement, meaning you put, when God moves in your life, you push the mourning out and you walk in joy. And joy means this. Joy doesn't is not an example that you don't have no external conflict, but what it means is inward. Inside, I can have joy and happiness because I know that God is working on my behalf, right? Everything does not have to be perfect in your life to have joy. That's why I say that you got a reason to rejoice. If you got a relationship with God and you know that God is powerful, God said, I replaced the morning. God says, stop crying, not because it's not important, but stop crying because I'm already working on it. You don't have to be sad. He says, I'm giving you joy. And so you walk with your head held up high, believing who it is that God has called you to be. I have joy in bad situation, not because all hell ain't breaking through in my life, but because I I know that an all-powerful God is working on my behalf, and I know that God cannot and God will not lose. I'm done. There's a shift. God says, I'm going to give them beauty for the ashes. Watch how God replaces. I'm going to give you oil for your mourning. He says, I'm going to give you the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Catch this before I take my seat. Remember I talked about being weary? You ever been physically right? You've been standing up straight physically, but on the inside, you feel like you're walking with you. Where there's just a spirit of heaviness all over you. Watch what God says. I'm going to take that negative spirit from you. Watch what he says. And give you a garment of praise. You know why we encourage you to worship on Sunday morning? Because praise is freeing. You know why we tell you to lift your hands? Because it's a sign to God that I yield. And what's the first thing the police tell you? Oh, I got to bring it home sometime to what we understand in our neighborhood. <laughs> police pull you over. Understand? What's the first thing they tell you to do? Put your hand. Why? Because you can't. And you yield and you're submitting to their what? Authority. <laughs> Some of you could already got your blessing. And God is trying to move. Watch this. But he needs you to put your hands up and yield so he can move in your life. But some of you won't come in here and worship and pray. When my kids were little, can I tell you the truth? And they would go and they would get filthy and dirty. Wait, we all had little kids. The first thing we got to pull that dirty, slimy, snotty shirt off of them. They got to lift their hands so you can take the dirty shirt off and throw it in the garbage so you can put something clever that you want to do. I yield. I submit. Some of us are tired of being sick and tired where if you're tired of being sick and tired why don't you lift your hands and let God take the heaviness and give you a spirit of praise <laughs> sitting there dirty and God is trying to change your situation because you won't let it go because you won't release because you got to be in charge God says I'm looking for some people who will submit to my authority and submit to my will so I can bless your life I'm done he said that they may be called trees of righteousness, but it's different in the text. Some text says that they're trees of oak. You ever do some study on an oak tree? An oak tree is one of the strongest trees. Oak. Some of y'all got some of that old oak furniture somewhere in your house. Been at it for 60 years, and it's going to got a knock in it. So I told you, some like oak. Planning of the Lord that he may be glorified. Oak is durable. 
It can be a storm. It can be a tornado. It can be a hurricane. And most times, watch this, the branches will shake and shudder on an oak tree. But sometimes what happens is that old oak base and those roots, those roots get so deep down in the ground, even though the top of the tree is shaking, there is something at the foundation of an oak tree where it cannot be turned over. Y'all missed it. Watch this. I'm going to say it again. It's okay for your life to be going topsy-turvy on top, but as long as your roots and your foundation is in God, you can stand whatever storm, you can stand whatever wind, you can stand whatever the bring. Life going crazy on top, but on the bottom, I'm secured and anchored in God. I'll never fall. I'll never fold because God upholds me. That is the good news and the reason that you and I have to rejoice on today. Because that is what God promises his people. If we believe what it is that he has spoken into our lives. Song says, I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me a blessed consolation that my trials come only to make me strong. Watch this. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to trust in God. I don't care what it is that you may be going through. Don't ever stop trusting in God. Don't ever stop believing what it is that he can do. Don't ever stop believing that he loves you and he cares you because you are in the comfort of God. Somebody should have started clapping already. And you got consolation in God. Because you can put your faith and hope and trust in God, you are forever okay. You have a reason to rejoice. I am not downgrading or trying to push away whatever may be going on in your life. Your emotions are real. Your problems are real. Your circumstances are real. The stuff going on with your children, oh, it's all real. But can I tell you who else is real? God is real. If you would only trust him with your situation, only trust him with your life, only trust him with your predicament hear me you have a reason to rejoice whomever I'm talking to that's going through whether in this place or at home I dare you to stand up and begin to worship God I dare you to stand up and tell God that you trust him God I don't know how it's going to work out God I don't know how you're going to figure it out God I'm tired and I'm weary God I'm worn down but I'm trusting you God in this situation to take me out of darkness and place me in marvelous light. God, I don't know financially how I'm going to figure it out, but I know that you're a God that provides. So therefore, I have a reason to rejoice. You may think I'm absolutely crazy that I come in here and shout and sweat and cry every Sunday. It don't mean that everything is perfect in Pastor Adam's life. It means that I know that I serve a perfect God. So when it doesn't go right, or how I hope that it would go, I don't look at it as a loss. I say it just wasn't God's time. So God, until we get to that place that I know you've called me to, work on me that you would prepare me. Make sense? It's all right. Everything's not going according to your plan. The Bible said we're foolish to make our plans and not consult the plans of God. And just because God said not yet doesn't mean that it's not going to come in your life. Hear me. Thank God for my wife because I was ready to run to the back of the room because my emotions took over. But as I sat on that table, y'all, I crossed my legs and my nice suit I had on. And I even let them see my pretty socks that I like to wear. And I sat there just as comfortable in that space and place. With my, and I was shaking hands and taking, I was the important person there that day. Because some of them got there because of who they knew, but I got there because of a God that knows me. So I knew that God had placed me. Stay with me. And I sat there enjoying every bit of it. And the table, can I tell you, it had a card on it that they had reserved. 
But I didn't see the card that said reserved at first. And I sat down. I said, I ain't supposed to be here. But I stayed. Hear me? And nobody ever told me to move. You know why? Because whatever door God opens, no man can close. Nobody can move me. I deserve to be in that place because God had a door, door ordained me to be in that place. All the nights that I cried and prayed that God would elevate me and take me to places, God says, you're here now, Adam. What you going to do with it? I'm telling somebody, you're here now, God, when he takes you there. What will you do with it? So in this season that you may be in, continue to let God shape and form you. To prepare you for where it is that he is taking you. But you got to let God do some replacement therapy. Replace that hardness in your heart sometimes. Can I tell you what the heart surgeon never does? He don't cut you open, take out the old heart that's malfunctioning, and then put it in there when you leave, put your old heart in the bag and tell you to go home with it. It's there. So why are some of us have given our heart and life to God and we drag an old heart, the old sin, the old stubbornness, the old hate, the old unforgiveness, the old pain, the old, you dragging around something that's dead and doesn't even work anymore, but you won't let it. And God keeps trying to give you replacement therapy so he can put inside you and allow you to walk, but you keep holding on. God says, I'm making an exchange in your life today if you'd only trust me. Father, we love you on today. We glorify you, Father. Thank you, Father, that wherever we may be, captive into our situation, that you proclaim that you're coming, that you freed us. You're setting us free. You're working on our behalf. You're avenging us, God, against every enemy, against everybody that has spoken bad against us, against every libelous claim, against all God. You are speaking freedom and liberty. And so we lift our hands on today. We say we submit to your will. We submit to your way, God. Whatever it is that you're doing, Father, wherever it is that you're working, we're joining you. We're trusting you. We're depending on you. Through it all, we've learned to trust in you father you are our anchor you are our hope you are our joy you are our peace father and we stand in that father thank you for loving us father and so I pray for that person on today father let them feel the warmth of your love in this moment let them feel your Holy Spirit comforting them in this moment I speak peace, I speak deliverance, I speak healing, Father, in somebody's heart and life on today. Thank you, Father, that we are not what we've been through. You saved us, you delivered us, Father. And we walk in the authority that you have given us. We trample on everything, Father. Every high thing in every high place that exalts itself against us, Father, we trample in the name of Jesus. And we declare victory in our lives to your glory, to your praise, Father, that you would be glorified. In the awesome name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone that agrees shout amen, amen. Now, if you know that God is working it out on your behalf, if you know that God is able to do abundantly above all you can ask or think, give God the glory. Rejoice already for what God is already doing. In due time, it's coming your way. Amen. We thank God for you. You may be seated. We praise God for you. We appreciate you. We're praying on your behalf. But there may be one under the sound of my voice, one who in this space or virtually, maybe you have not had the opportunity to confess Jesus Christ or give him your heart. We give you that opportunity today. And the, and, and the Bible is clear that we believe, amen, but that we confess Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, that God sent his son, that he came, that he lived, that he died, that he was buried, but that he got up with all power in his hands. Amen? That is what we believe. We affirm that each and every day. And that he was ascended into heaven, sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and one day he's coming back again. That's our hope. That's our faith. That's what is trust that we affirm. And so we give our life. We submit to him. And then though life gets hard, can I tell you what it's not? 
giving your life to God, Christ, doesn't mean that everything will be perfect. But there will come a day, amen, that because you've given your life to him, that when he comes and he takes us home into heaven to be where everything will be perfect. And so God is our eternal hope, amen? That is why we endure as hard soldiers, as good soldiers. Not that I'm not taking a beating down here, but a God that I know that can heal me and comfort and keep me, what? Until that time where I see my Savior face to face. And so that's how we preach this gospel. That's the good news that I give you. That we are sinners saved by grace. Nothing we can do to earn it, but God has given it freely through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is available. Even if you don't come at this time, you listen, just reach out to us. Pull me to the side, Reverend Curry, someone, if you would love to give your life to Christ and have us explain. Maybe there's someone looking for a church home. We'd love to have you. We're just a small church trying to do, amen. And I'm just saying inside, not in heart, not in spirit, because we do everything and more than any church that got a thousand people have to do, because we don't let anything get in our way. But we're just a church, no matter our size, that is committed to doing the work of the Lord. Amen. And so if you want to be a part of a church like that, we welcome you. Just reach out to us through our social media pages, uh, through our website, um, and someone will contact you. At this time, we're prepared to take up our gifts and to take up our offerings. As I said to you earlier, we're a church that's committed to doing ministry. And so even on this week, as we have cared for the, the, uh, the disadvantaged and the unsheltered, um, and those who are in food deserts, uh, that is what we seek to do. And so we're coming up on a season, even though we've just finished our prison ministry part, it's getting cold outside, amen? And some of us are covered and have blankets and all of that, but there's others who are outdoors. And so uh, we are preparing for our winter outreach drive where we do our help in our, for those who are um, unsheltered. Um, and so just know that your gifts and your offerings and your tithes, that they go uh, to being a blessing. I believe the different forms of giving uh, are available uh, on the screen there. But whether you give through Givelify and look for Warren Chapel and Pedro Cash App or either Zell, um, just know that your gifts help us to continue the work that God would have us to do. If you want to do outreach and work with us, we don't only ask for your finances, but when we get ready to go out and do outreach, we would love for you to join us as we go out in the community. If that's what God has called you to do, let's go out and be a blessing to someone. Amen. Uh, but we thank you for your gifts, your tithes, your offering. I want you to know that you're sowing into good ground. And so I believe that God will continue to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings that you will not have room enough to receive as God continues to work on your behalf. So we say thank you. Have you been blessed on today? Amen. If God has blessed you on today, I encourage you, right? For some of us, we have the opportunity when you leave this place and you go and you have a conversation with someone, share with someone the gospel and the good news of Jesus that you heard. For those who are all too, who are tuning in, uh, uh, Facebook, YouTube, will you do me a favor? Will you hit that button that says share? And would you share our church? Would you share this word on today? If you believe that it was a, a life-giving word, a life that a word that will be a blessing to someone else, go and share it with your friends and your family. Also, like, leave a comment. Um, and I, at first I wasn't too into the social media thing, but I understand that is where God has placed us. And so this is the platform of how we share the gospel. And that's all that I'm concerned with, that the good news of Jesus Christ gets out. And so, yeah, am I asking? I'm asking those who are in the building to go out and share the gospel. But those who are at home, hit that button, share, like, comment that someone else, amen, will be blessed by what it is that God has given you. Father, we thank you for the gift as well as the giver on today. Bless everyone that had to give and those who did not have to give, Father. We ask that you'll bless 30, 60, 100 fold. And every gift, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will direct us and lead us into what it is that you would have us to do, Father, with all that you bless us with. Bless us. Thank you for this time that we shared. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Um, I want to. Did you want to share a word with us today, Danielle? If you do, it's fine. If you don't, it's up to you. But I wanted to give you uh, that opportunity. Would you give her a hand as she comes? Amen. I have learned to appreciate her and her spirit. I came today because, as I shared with you, when I came, it was because I wanted to share that love. But today, I just had a calling, 
like the day that I decided to run for office. We did so many amazing things. It's not a lot. I answered a call, I walked through that door. And now people have a voice. They are being seen, they're being heard. They're being helped. And I was being used for a purpose to share that, to bring them out of that darkness, to show where the need is. So our work isn't done. But I also want to say thank you because when I found those dark times and those dark spaces, you were there for me. And together, we're going to be there for each other in the community. And we're going to continue the work. So thank you. I'm truly grateful. Thank you. So we're thankful and grateful, amen. Um, but continue to pray uh, for Danielle and her work that she has done, amen, and that we'll be able to continue to collaborate and do work, because it's really, that's really what it's all about, is just us coming together to make a difference in the community, amen, for those who have a heart in the community, so whomever and whatever, just to get the work done, and so we're thankful again to you, uh, Danielle, thank you for letting me, thank you for trusting me in those moments, in those times where you called and we could pray together. Um, and be a source of encouragement. Thank you for trusting me um, with that. Um, and I look forward to doing more amazing things and great work with you and Joseph um, and the whole community. Amen. Uh, we are preparing to go. Um, I thank God for you. Um, thank God how he has blessed us. Um, as we come upon this Christmas and holiday season, don't forget to continue to share that Jesus is the reason for the season. Uh, don't forget to encourage somebody as you come along. I know it's busy. I know the stores are full and all these different things, but make sure we do what we're supposed to do. Amen. The, the, word, the Bible calls for God calls for us to be salt and light. So let's make sure that we're just making the difference that God has called for us to make. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you'll bless us, Father, as we leave from this place, Father, but that we're never out of your presence. Father, bless us as we go into this week. Keep us, protect us, Father. Comfort us like only you can comfort. We love you, we thank you, and we give you all the glory. In the awesome name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Give God a hand of praise. God bless you. We love you. Be strong and courageous.